It's my great joy to welcome our special guest tonight. She is Professor Emerita of Classics at the University of Cambridge and the Classics Editor of the Times Literary Supplement. Her previous books, which have been translated into over 30 languages, include the best-selling Wolfston Prize-winning Pompeii, Confronting the Classics, SPQR, which I'm sure a lot of you have read, Women and Power, another classic, Twelve Caesars, and most recently her new book, Emperor of Rome. You may, of course, also know her from her numerous television series that have brought the ancient world to life on our screens. Before we welcome Professor Mary Beard, uh, I'd like to play a little video. Would you please welcome Professor Mary Beard? Wow. <laughs> what great a trailer. To be, great to be here. <laughs> Thank you so here. much. What a fantastic trailer. Yeah, it's, uh, it was put together from a variety of clips from um, television series, both of the past and the future. Many of those are, um, are, are actually from a, a program about the Roman Emperor, which has not yet been shown on British television. So it, it got its first public viewing here. Um, but it gives you a little bit um, uh, of, a, a, of a hint about what the book that I've just written is about. And it, I think, I hope it gets the, the point that Emperor of Rome, the book, is not a series of biographies. Um, it covers um, the idea of one-man rule from the middle of the first century BC with Julius Caesar to the middle of the third century uh, AD CE with the completely unknown Alexander Severus. Um, but what he doesn't try to do at all is to say you have to master the biographies one by one. That's what you're usually taught, you know, that you've got to know that Tiberius is a hypocritical, nasty piece of work, um, Claudius is a bit doddery, Nero is a psychopathic megalomaniac, etc., etc. Trying to say, look, forget that, that bits of that might be important. It's saying, think about uh, the Roman, the, the Roman Empire, and Roman Emperor as if they were more similar than they are different. Think of the think of all the questions that you sort of want to ask, but I mean, most of us, me included, are often too nervous. Like, you know, how did they get around? Where did they live? Um, who wrote the letters for them? Um, what was um, what was their sex life really like? We're going to get into that one later. We will get into that. <laughs> we will get. I'm sure you um, all want to know. Uh, so it's it's um, it's in a way it's a kind of attempt to recreate the job description of the Roman emperor, in part lurid, uh, in part much more boring you could ever imagine. Right? You know, the Roman emperor it seems to me spent more time at the filing cabinet than he did <laughs> having sex in the swimming pool. But um, <laughs> you know, never mind. Um, and you know, I want to try to think about why these guys still matter, really. Uh -huh. Reading all... your book, it struck me that this is more of a biography of the job description of the emperor. And I wanted to ask you, why this book? Why now? I only, I only realised why I was writing it, and I think this is very common, um, when I got to the end. Right? You know, you, you start out with a project, you've got a book contract, someone's telling you you've got to do it, and you, you get kind of overwhelmed by that. When, you, when I got to the end, I, I thought, so why have I written this now? Why, why did writing about the power of the Roman emperor, you know, in the early 2020s, why did that seem important? And in part, I think it does seem important because 
we might be too anxious, but I think we're looking at a world in which democracy seems a bit perilous. We're looking at a world of um, some form of autocratic rule um, creeping up either very publicly or under the, you know, under the carpet in lots of places across the world. And I, I kind of saw that maybe it wasn't entirely coincidence that I thought, um, I want to write about the Roman emperor. And I, I suppose I also thought, what, what are the lessons here for us? You know, if you, you think of you know, a series of about 30 one-man rulers from the mid-first century, as I said, BC, to the mid-third century CE, you know, what, what is the message? You know, what, what, would I, what, what do I think the takeaway point is? And to some extent, I think this is a very nice 19, well, the horrible 19th century <laughs> I image of the assassination of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar is actually not the star of the show. I'm afraid his rather kind of gory body <laughs> is bottom left, and the triumphant conspirators are holding their daggers up um, in rather premature celebrations, in that, you know, like many assassins, they were not bad at killing their victim, but they were hopeless at having a forward plan. So everything <laughs> went really badly wrong after this. Um, and there's, a, there's some guy sitting back there, you know, and he knows things are going to go wrong. <laughs> but I, I, mean, I, I think our, our vision of the Roman Empire and the Roman Emperor is one we kind of imagine a big conflict between most people, most senators, um, and imperial power, right? We think that and when we put ourselves back into the Roman uh, Empire, I think we imagine ourselves as dissidents, as people who would oppose this kind of dictatorship. And there were some of those in Rome. You know, Rome had its Navalnys, but it didn't have many of them. And I felt that in some ways, and it was a surprising lesson for me, really, I thought that one of the things that I'd learned from writing this book about the day-to-day -day life of, um, of the centre of power was that it wasn't violence that kept the Roman emperor in power. It wasn't, you know, it, Rome was a pretty bloody place, but... You know, and there were victims of Roman emperors, but that wasn't why this system, individuals, you know, were disposable, but the system lasted for hundreds of years. You know, and I think what I'd learnt was that it was because people went along with it. You know, that the Roman one-man rule was kept in place because vast majority of people either accepted it positively or didn't bother to make a fuss. They muttered at dinner, but they went into work the next day and did the emperor's bidding. And I thought there was a lesson for us there, because you know, it's, it's very easy to um, talk you know, in anxious terms about whether you know, democracy is perilous, and I don't I'm not sure what the answer to that is. But I think one thing we've got to know that if it is perilous, we mustn't do what the Romans did. The Romans just went along with it. And that kept the emperor in power, for, for worse or better. And I think we've got to realize that we, there's a possibility that we might be like that. I, mean, I once asked a group of students in Cambridge, very bright students, about 20 of them, and we were talking about history of the mid-20th century, and I said, what do you think you'd have done if you'd lived in occupied France in the Second World War? Every single bloody one of them said, I'd have joined the resistance. <laughs> and, you know, say, sorry, everybody, the statistics suggest that maybe <laughs> one of you would, you know? And so I thought there was, in a way, um, although I hadn't set out to write this for this reason, in a way, 
I hope that under, you know, a bit under the counter, um, it's a wake-up call for saying if we don't want this kind of system, we've got to, we've got to shout and perhaps do more. If we're thinking about wake-up calls, what do you think are some of the warning signs for the establishment of one-man rule? Because um, I want to go back to the origins of the Roman, the imperial system in Rome. For those of here who might be unfamiliar with how the emperor yeah. became a concept at the very beginning, where did that come from? Um, you have to... There's a basic, really inconvenient paradox about the Roman Empire and the Emperor. Um, and that paradox is that um, the Roman state acquired its empire while it was a democracy. Um, and the empire then gives birth to the emperor rather than the emperor acquiring the empire. The number of imperial conquests under one man rule are very few and very short lived. Right? Um, it's the kind of sort of democracy of the Roman Republic that, for reasons we don't understand, expands enormously. And the standard answer, then, is that that expansion is just too much for this little city. I mean, it started out as a bog-standard, pretty hopeless little city on the banks of the Tiber that no one took any notice of. And you know, eventually people woke up to the fact that it had conquered most of Italy and then conquered most of the rest of the Mediterranean. The problem was that its institutional structure um, really couldn't cope with um, managing, uh, even at a very basic level, um, the imperial territory that it had conquered. I mean, for a start, it's all too far away. You know, you know, if you've got a, uh, if, if you've got uh, an outpost of empire in Syria, it takes you at some times of the year three months to get a message from Rome to Syria. Um, and that's the kind of problem you're dealing with. So, one of the factors was that it kind of that the empire destroyed the city, the the, the, the politics of the city that had created it. But here I think there is a sort of, is another warning for us, because it looks like the Romans are then saying, well, the only way to deal with this then, uh, the, our problems are so big, we've just got to have one man in control. Now, I, I think that we can see um, possibilities within our world of saying the only way to deal with this is to have one bloke and it would be a bloke, um, uh, dealing with it. It's always a bloke. Yeah, it's always, I mean, it's always a bloke, you know. Um, uh, you know, e e even some of, you know, Mrs. Thatcher, it was, you know, not even, not even she would, would, <laughs> would be a one-man ruler. Um, and I think that there is a, uh, there are many other factors to the origin of one-man rule in Rome, but, you know, one of the things that's important is, again, people sort of come to accept that our problems are so big that we need President X or Prime Minister Y to really take control. And so we, we lose out. We lose out and we think, we think well, it's, it's the lesser of two evils. Mm. Right so if that's how... Uh, Imperial Rome was founded, how you establish one-man rule. Let's talk a bit about, I was fascinated by the stories in your book about succession <laughs> between emperors, yeah. often a very bloody, messy process, sometimes less messy. And I think that ideas about succession are having a bit of a moment right now. Because <laughs> we've all watched the television. Yes, <laughs> we've all watched the television. Well, there's the uh, hit TV show Succession. Yeah. We just saw the crowning of a new king at Westminster Abbey last year. And I think that ideas about how we do a transfer yeah, of power yeah, yeah. today is yeah. sort of being reflected upon. How did it work in ancient Rome? Very, very difficultly is the answer to that. Now, uh, there is a real problem, as I've hinted before, 
that the Roman Empire and a system of one-man rule governing it is extraordinarily uh, resilient. You know, in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, it lasts till the 15th century. But even in the west, it lasts till the 5th century. It's half a millennium of one-man rule. And there are big questions about why, given all the problems, it did last. I mean, part of the answer to that is they nationalized the army uh, and basically prevented for a long time, not in the end, not forever, uh, they prevented soldiers and legions intervening in political debate. And that was, in, if you want to say there's a genius um, in the, the Roman Empire, you know, rather nasty genius, it, that is how the first proper emperor after Caesar, that was his big thing. He, he, he prevented soldiers fighting out politics. However, one thing that the Roman Empire never sussed, absolutely never sussed, was succession. That Augustus was uh, an extraordinary founding father in all kinds of ways. Um, one thing he never laid down was how imperial power should be passed on or to whom. And I think that's, you know, particularly for Brits, that seems weird, you know, because <laughs> you think, well, it's obvious, isn't it? You know, it's, it's the eldest son, right? It's the eldest son, or, you know, we could be radical, we can say it's the eldest child, whether it's uh, son or daughter, and the system of primogeniture, and the idea that power and property goes down the generations through the eldest child is one that seems kind of self-evident within a lot of Western monarchies now. Now, there's a lot the matter with that. Uh, the problem about primogeniture is that it can land you with a complete dumbo <laughs> on the throne just because he or she happens to be the eldest child. You get no choice, you know. Um, uh, the advantage is that there's no contest. You know, there's a rule, and you follow the rule, and if you end up with bloody Edward VIII, well, you just hope it doesn't last very long. Right? <laughs> in some ways, uh, Rome, in not having that system, uh, gives itself a lot more choice. You know, you don't have to have the really hopeless character on the throne, and you can look around in the extended family, and you can use a principle of adoption and that kind of thing to get, uh, to, to kind of nominate an heir. But the difficulty of that is that you're always fighting about it. Primogeniture is great, because you don't fight, you just get, the, you know, if you're Harry, you get pissed off. Um, but there's, you know, Harry's not gonna be king, right? Um, and Lumpet is the, the, the system, basically. Um, uh, in the Roman system, Harry would have a chance of actually out, out you know, of getting rid of Wills. Um, uh, and there would be always this kind of sense of, it was always up for grabs right until the last minute who was going to uh, succeed. And it, it gives the the court at Rome, a hugely awkward edge, because the court, the, you know, the where the emperor operates, who the emperor has dinner with, who is in favor and who isn't, that is all about the maneuverings for succession. And the, what the Roman court do is maneuver for succession. Mm. Once they've done that, you know, once the next guy uh, has reached the throne, has bribed the army, has given the donative to the people, and has um, you know, generally kind of um, put a load of statues of himself everywhere, um, what happens is that they, they make a huge parade of how legitimate they are. And I've just got one slide here which I think helps understand that. 
which is uh, here are you know, three emperors of the second century CE, and you think, blimey, they all look the same. How would you ever tell them <laughs> apart, right? You know, there's Marcus Aurelius. What's the difference between him and Septimius Severus? This is the usual real off-turn when you see them in museums. Um, uh, the whole point is they look the same. You know, these guys, Septimius Severus, in a kind of fantastic bit of fiction, had himself posthumously adopted by the long-dead Marcus Aurelius <laughs> in order to give himself a good claim to the throne. And then what does he do? He has all his statues made, so he looks like Marcus Aurelius. And Marcus Aurelius looks pretty much like Antoninus Pius. And what they're telling you is that I am legitimate. And that's the peril. And these are the winners. And you know, so if, whenever you go to a museum and you think, I can't tell one Roman emperor from the next, the point is not you are stupid, you are right. <laughs> you know? they, well, that is what they wanted you to think, right? They've definitely all got the same barber, I think. They have got the same there, bearded. Probably a you know? place in Fitzroy that'll give you that, I reckon. <laughs> um, Sticking on the subject of succession, I wanted to ask you about some of the women of ancient Rome because there is a uh, pervasive, shall we say, trope <laughs> of yeah. behind the scenes, behind all of these sort of, you know, um, uh, tensions over who's going to be the next emperor. Uh, the ancient sources often tell us that there are women pulling the strings. How true are those <laughs> stories? Can we trust them? And who were some of these women who were said to be I think many, many people over 40 have had a chuckle here um, <laughs> because this was Sean Phillips as Augustus's wife, Livia, from that old 1970s BBC series, I, Claudius, which is probably still the best on-screen adaptation of Roman history ever. Might be completely wrong, but it's brilliant, <laughs> right? And the whole point about I, Claudius, and I think Livia's sinister expression here, um, was to suggest to you that in that story of imperial power, and particularly in this case, the, the, the story of contested succession, that behind the scenes, the puppet masters were the women, right? And uh, the standard version would go, um, look at Livia, what does she do during the reign of her husband Augustus? Both of them had been married before, they had no children together. She, by um, some very crafty poisoning tactics, manages to ensure that everybody that Augustus marks out as his heir has a nasty, uh, mysterious, and premature death, which is nothing to do with poison at all. It's just et some very, you know, something that didn't agree with him. Um, and in the end, who takes the throne? Livia's son by her previous marriage, the Emperor Tiberius. QED, there's the power maker. Now, Roman writers said that. Robert Graves said that. Modern historians have said that. And it's possible that it's true. I, I've, I've always felt... I've always felt anxious about it, partly because it's so bloody misogynist. Right? Here you've got a world in which, which women have no formal power whatsoever. Right? They can't hold office. They can't of any kind of political sort. They can't be emperor. There's not even, although we call them empresses, there isn't even a kind of job as being empress. And what do we say? We say, we take one of these essentially powerless individuals and we say, she fixed it all. Now, I think there is a message for us here, too. I mean, you can't know if it's true. Um, but the, the tendency, I think, to explain things in the male world, or, you know, even more, I think, to explain why men make such a mess of things by blaming the women, it, it goes back to certainly the Romans, 
Um, we've learned, we've learned our excuses um, from Romans. I mean, that the, we don't know what goes on in the palace. We can't actually see. You know, no longer is politics in Rome um, something which is, takes place in the open, in public. So how do we explain it? We explain it by taking the women and saying it's their fault. It's their fault. Now, in the UK, we've just had a, um, an, or in the process of having an inquiry into Boris Johnson's handling of COVID. Uh, and uh, I was gobsmacked by how even senior civil servants would come to this inquiry under oath, and when asked why Johnson had made this decision or that decision, they would say, it was his wife, Carrie, that made that decision. <laughs> what? Uh, it's, uh, we've done it before. I'm sure it's done here. Nancy Reagan was supposed to have ruled Ron. Um, Sherry Blair was supposed to have made the decisions for Tony. And uh, we're, not, we're not that different from the Livia phenomenon. Mm. Now, you know... Maybe Carrie did, you know? I don't think it's terribly likely. I mean, we don't, I mean, Boris Johnson seems to me to be someone who's perfectly capable of making mistakes himself <laughs> without <laughs> blaming the wife. But that is the structure of, you know, of the political, essentially, a misogynist is putting it a bit far, but it's essentially it's a sexist version mm. of how you explain things. Mm. And the Roman Empire is full of women being blamed for what the emperors do. Mm -hmm. You've written a lot about women in power. In fact, that is the name of your 2017, I believe, Feminist Manifesto. Um, and of course, this book, though, you do talk about some of the women in the imperial court, but for the large part, it is, of course, about the blokes. Yeah. I wanted to uh, know if you think that feminism and your interest in women's history has impacted how you write about men? Yes, I think it has. I mean, I think it's, it's impacted about how you write about, how I write about power, you know, because I think that, you know, one of the, the things that a woman does, or I do, when I'm looking at uh, the power structures of the Roman Empire, is I look for the women, and I wonder what it was like to be them, and um, you know, I think that people often say, oh, you can't, you know, we don't know anything about the women in the, in the Roman Empire. We don't know anything about the enslaved. What it means is we've never looked for it. But, you know, and if you look for it, you find it. I think that it helps you take the blokes down a peg or two. I mean, I think that feminism for me has helped me not be quite so taken in by that, you know, that image of, conquering male power. You know, I think, sometimes I think it's a bit silly. Um, but it's also, I think, made me a bit kinder to these guys. Because I think looking at, uh, looking at the double bind that these supposedly all-powerful men were caught in, I mean, I, I deplore the system but I kind of feel a little bit sorry for them. You know, I, uh, that was another thing that happened at the end of the book. I thought, you know, I, I feel slightly sorry for them. I mean, I, and I came to see the palace, and I think you could do this for many autocrats or, you know, even democratically elected political leaders now. Um, you know, one of the things that you learn about how the Roman court works, or one of the things that Roman writers tell you, is that the emperor only receives flattery. Now, what that means is that the emperor is the one person in the Roman world who knows that no one ever tells him the truth. So he is imprisoned in at the pinnacle of a hierarchy where he can't believe anything that anybody says, and he knows it. Now, I think that, you know, that seems in a way a long way from feminism, but I think that it, that 
uh, I think a kind of feminist confidence enables you to, to see through the facade of absolute power. Absolute power is never absolute power. There are, you know, there are always people who are manipulating. The guy is always the prisoner. You know, and they know their vulnerability uh, and that that goes along with absolute power. I mean, Domitian is a particularly, in the traditional narrative, a particularly nasty character from the end of the first century CE. Had, it had makes well. He has two important observations, or does two important things. One is he is supposed to have had the walls of the palace, or particularly the colonnades that he walked in, lined with reflective stone, so he could see who was coming up behind. Right now, that's not a Julius Caesar-style assassination. That's because. You can't trust anybody at home. Where do, where do these emperors get killed? They get killed at home, right? They don't, you know, Julius Caesar is a real rarity in getting killed in public. Mostly they get smothered by their personal trainer or something like that. Right? <laughs> what a horrible way to go. Horrible way to go, <laughs> isn't it? Domitian also said, and it's a kind of, you know, it's a warning. Um, nobody believes that there's a plot against the emperor until he's dead. So he's capturing. I mean, I think that feminism, or I suppose, you know, the, the self-confidence of seeing through this crap that feminism brings does help you see through the crap. It helps you see a different version of what it's like. Do you want to be emperor? No, you jolly well don't. I think I would rather be a, a nobody in Rome than the emperor, to be honest. I think, you know, we would, I'd rather be a humble attendant at the Roman baths than be emperor. On a slightly different angle, perhaps a lighter, or perhaps actually not a lighter topic, I was fascinated in your book, your descriptions of imperial dining. Yes. How the emperor ate what he ate, what happened at dinner. Can you describe a typical dinner with the emperor well, for us? We've got Livia here. She's, you know, one thing we all know, that when Romans go to dinner, they recline, right? And here is em Empress, quotes Livia, um, reclining at dinner and, and plotting a bit of poisoning. <laughs> now, let me say, um, most ordinary Romans did not recline at dinner. You know, but this is like kind of, this is sort of dinner jacket, tuxedo style dinner. Most ordinary Romans went to the local takeaway, sat on ordinary seats, just as we would, and had a burger, you know, basically. Um, you have to go pretty upmarket before you find the classic movie style of Roman dining. But the movies for the upmarket get it right, really. Um, Here's a sort of halfway up market um, uh, dining room at Pompeii, and it kind of gets the, I think it gets the impression for you. People recline on these slightly uncomfortable stone benches. Um, you hope there were cushions, um, and in this case, as often, they would uh, be all around what is in the middle a pool of water. So you would recline here, looking at yourself in, reflected in the water, nice shade over the top. Now, that's the sort of very upper middle class kind of version of dining. What you see when you get to, into the imperial family, is that dining is the place where the emperor is on display to the, the, not to the ordinary people who never get a chance to dine in the palace, but to fellow members of the Roman elite. And it's also the place, the absolutely prime site of crime and conspiracy. So it's luxury, um, over-the-topness, but it's also, I mean, it's kind of, 
I mean, I was trying to think of the parallel. I think if you kind of pick up a British novel and you discover that they're all going to a weekend at a country house, <laughs> you know someone's going to be dead by the end of the weekend, right? Well, you go to a Roman dinner and someone <laughs> in the imperial house is going to be dead. Now, the, I mean, I think it's very hard now to encapsulate really the... Um, the sort of luxury or weirdness that we're dealing with. Um, water is often involved. The Romans, Ro the Roman elite, if they had one passion, you know, it's not gold-plated taps, it's dining to the sound of running water. That's what they wanted to do. Or in this case, this is an imperial dining suite um, just south of Rome at Spurlonga. And it's, it is, you can't really believe this. It doesn't look like a dining suite now, but you've got a cave. Uh, the cave was originally full of sculpture, but that sort of green bit there, and you see it the other way round, looking out of the cave on the right, that is where the diners would have their couches set up. They would be looking into the cave, and then you say, well, how do they get the food? Well, it is floated across to them on little boats, <laughs> right? Okay. And um, this is only one example. This is a seriously surviving example of that sort of a kind of dining ingenuity, which emperors particularly invested in. Caligula is supposed to have dined up a tree, right? To have had couches put in, the, uh, in, in a tree. And you know, other people do all kinds of things. This water, water and boat stuff is quite common. And we have descriptions by Romans talking about um, getting the stuff uh, sort of sailed across to them. It makes you think, I have to say, I think this is really important, that our image of Roman kind of mega consumption is probably, well, at least in some cases, wrong. You know, if it's being floated across in a little boat, what it is is a kind of tapas. I think most, <laughs> I think most Roman meals like this, you know, and then the boats will get, they'll get marooned and some poor enslaved person will have to kind of get them off. And anyway, you couldn't eat very much because you're lying down, you've got a glass in one hand and, you've only, and you don't have a fork because forks haven't been invented. So, you know, it's kind of different from what what we, um, what we expect. However, I think that there's also the extraordinary sense that this is a, a place that threatens you, that the emperor is on display, we're all on display, and it's the one place, and I say the movies have this right, where you uh, could be humiliated and you could be humiliated to death. And it's, in, in some ways, if you say, look, where do you see Roman imperial power in action? It's not the Senate House, it's not on the battlefield, it's in the dining room. And this is a great 19th century version um, of a famous Roman dinner, probably entirely fictional, but presented as fact. And it's uh, a, a dinner party of the emperor Elagabalus, not exactly well known. Um, it, he's at the back in his slightly, you know, his nifty gold outfit, reclining and looking out. Um, uh, he's actually a teenager, and he's in the early third century, and he comes from Syria, and he was manoeuvred onto the throne um, in all kinds of, you know, dastardly ways. But he, the accounts we have of this guy kind of really encapsulate what's the problem with Roman, um, uh, uh, with Roman imperial power, and they often centre around the dining room. And here, what Elagabalus has done is he's really been generous to his guests, very, very generous, and he's showered them with fantastically expensive rose petals. You know, they've come through the ceiling, the ceiling has opened. Uh, it's absolutely marvellous, except that there's so many that he smothers them and they die. <laughs> and this is a 19th century kind of encapsulation of that. And, um, 
uh, you can see, if you go and look at this picture, and there's a picture of it in my book, you can, it's a very clever painting because it's clear when you look at the individual faces that some of the guests are still, still thinking this is quite good fun, right? <laughs> and others of the guests, by now, uh, clearly know that this isn't going to end well. Mm. I also love the stories about guests being served fake food yeah. as a kind of... Uh, a sort of um, a jab, yeah, you know, and colour-coded food. And <laughs> the gambler is very keen on that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I think we all know that the communal dining is both uh, uh, equality. It both parades equality, but it also parades hierarchy, right? We all, you know, we all know. I'm sure what it's like to be sitting at a kind of slightly posh dinner and you're clearly in the least posh place, right? <laughs> Behind the column, right? <laughs> you know, at the end of the table when you can't speak to anybody, you know. And in my, you know, my college in Cambridge, I sit on the high table and I have good food and better wine than the students who are sitting below. I know what that's like. You know what that's <laughs> like, Mary? You know, she's experienced Cambridge. Um, uh, and... We know, you know, eat, that's what communal eating is all about. It's about hierarchy masquerading as equality. Mm. And the Romans are brilliant, but uh, as always, the Romans do things kind of more clearly than we do. Um, so uh, the story is about the, the lower orders being served wax food or wooden food, um, while the people on the top table... Um, are eating real food, and you have to sit there and pretend to like the you, know, you pretend to like the wax food while you know your tummy's rumbling and you're watching the other guys tucking into whatever they're tucking into. Terrible. From the dining room, I'd like to move to the bedroom, if we may, <laughs> and ask a question that I'm sure everyone's very curious about. What do we know about the Roman emperor's sex life? Depends what you mean by no, right? And we hear a lot of tales about the emperor's sex life. Um, and we hear a lot of tales about how much time the emperor spends indulging in his peculiar perversions, right? As if somehow all Roman emperors had to do was um, enjoy themselves. And, you know, one of the classic ones is um, the emperor Tiberius, who um, apparently, when he went to his villa on Capri, um, he used to spend much of the time in the swimming pool, but with little boys swimming with him, whom he called his minnows, who pleasured him by nibbling his genitals while he swam. Right? And you think that, you know, in some ways, it's, it's that kind of exploitation, really, that, that captures... Um, Roman imperial excess. Um, you know, I, I feel uncertain about how, how true that is. I mean, I think an awful lot of these stories about um, the sex life of Roman emperors is, well, it's very like celebrity gossip. You know, that what, what the tellers whether they're modern tellers of this or ancient tellers of this, because everybody's interested in the sex life of the emperors, from Roman writers to modern writers. Partly they're a projection of our own fantasies. I don't know what, you know, what would I do? You know, what kind of sex life would I have if I could have anything I wanted? And that is kind of projected and then enters into... Um, the storybooks and becomes um, a stamp of, of Roman imperial power and pleasure. Now, you know, my hunch is that actually Roman emperors spent a hell of a lot more time um, signing letters than they did having little boys nibble their genitals in the swimming pool. Um, but it, it has been from antiquity itself part of the mark of the emperor, that they, that their sex life is larger than life. Now, I don't know, you know, I think it's always very, people always say, well, was that true? 
A, I don't know. Uh, and B, you know, we don't know about the sex life of anybody else in the modern world, so we haven't got much hope, I think, of knowing about the truth of the sex life of the Roman emperor. It is part of, of how his power is seen and perceived. You know, that, you know, he has more partners. They are more beautiful. He gets more kind of upset when they die. Um, it is it's a kind of magnification. And much like all kind of imperial, you know, anything the emperor does is sort of larger than life. Mm. Um, you know, and I, th this comes back to the feminist stuff, I kind of think, well, maybe it's true, but actually I think maybe it was all a bit boring, you know? <laughs> maybe Tiberius just kind of went to bed on his own, usually. He had a whole hard day at the filing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Moving Dreaming from. of what it might be like to be in a swimming pool <laughs> with little boys. Four, right? Oh dear. Moving from from these unreliable textual <laughs> sources that I, that you deal with so so well in your book and really assess, you know, how much of it we can really believe. As as an art historian, I'm I'm particularly interested in the visual, you know, representations that survive from ancient Rome and what they tell us about life. Um, and I was really fascinated by your descriptions of archaeological sites uh, from the ancient world that, you know, we haven't always got right, that we're, there's lots of debate about what some of these places are. And I was wondering if you could tell us yes. a bit about some of them. Yeah, this goes, you know, th throughout the Roman world, there are misinterpreted bits of archaeology, which when you know about it, seems very funny. Um, this, for example, which you can still visit uh, in the centre of Rome. It's called the Auditorium of Mycenas. Now, Mycenas was um, a, an interesting character who was a friend of the Emperor Augustus and was always said to be his kind of unofficial minister of culture, that it was Mycenas who commissioned Virgil to write the Aeneid. He's the so arts forth. minister. The arts, right? He's yeah. the arts minister. You know, but instead of cutting the budget, my Cenas, <laughs> I think, increased the budget. So it's not a typical arts minister. <laughs> and here's this. You, know, you, you can still be told um, by unreliable guidebooks that this building, it's got a new roof on, but it was discovered in the 19th century uh, in a part of Rome where we believe that Mycenas had his estates. And it, it, what you see at the back is a series of steps, and it's called the Auditorium of Mycenas because um, everybody thought, God, this is where Virgil gave the previews of his Aeneid. Right? The audience sat up there, and down here you'd have had Virgil giving a kind of private performance to select um, a, a group of Mycenas and his friends, no doubt, Augustus. Um, and here we are at the centre of Roman culture. Well, we are at the centre of Roman culture, but not in the same way. I think what everybody now believes this to be is another dining room, actually. Um, and, you know, remember what I said about water. What seems pretty clear is that those steps are, are not a sort of auditorium where we might sit uh, in nice, ranked order, um, but is actually um, a water feature. And water would flash down all over that, and the diners would have couches set up in this open area here, and they would look at the water. Now, Virgil might have been amongst them, but he damn certainly wasn't reading the Aeneid <laughs> to them, and this was not a theatre. And uh, it, there is you know, one of, the, I think, the pleasures of doing uh, Roman history and Roman archaeology is not only discovering it and rediscovering it, it's seeing how earlier generations have interpreted things differently and wrongly and also remembering that later generations will come and tell us that we're wrong about some of the things that, that we think we're certain of. Um, but th this has been a classic case. And I think that um, you also find... Um, a slightly different way, that sort of 
classic case of misinterpretation um, in the central city imperial palace itself. Now, it's well worth visiting, in some ways, the Palatine Hill at Rome. It gives us the name of palace. It's where the emperor lived. But I have to say, it doesn't look very grand, right? That's what you, um, that's what you see on the ground. And it's pretty impossible, actually, to make much sense of it. It hasn't stopped people trying to reconstruct it, <laughs> right? And they always reconstruct it in the same way. Um, you know, and as misleadingly as the poor old auditorium of Mycenas, it's always a kind of bit of a cross between fascism and Versailles. <laughs> <laughs> and hardly any people, right? And no furniture, right? And no bric-a-brac. And any but I just picked these out of just perfect, you know, perfectly good books. You know, saying, what does the interior of the palace look like? And some of some of the the, the, the features are right. I think it, it captures very nicely the fact that the marble would be brightly coloured. You know, we think of Roman marble as being all white. That was really bog standard, bottom of the range, right? Cheap, right? That's what you want, and they've got that uh, all correctly. But I, I, I think it's, for me, this just, it just gets the Roman palace so wrong because it's so bloody clean, I think. <laughs> Where are the it's, toilets? That's what I... I mean, where's the lavatories? Where, where yeah, we those? saw some lavatories on the video. You know, 40-seater labs, right? A lot of people, <laughs> right? And you know, there is no lighting here. There is no, there's no kind of nice little oil lamps or sideboards or... You know, where do you sit, you know? And the... Uh, 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 you know, occasionally you see these little white figures... You know, and there's a few kind of, there's, a, there's the beginning of a crowd here, but uh, it, it just, it kind of sets us up for thinking about the Roman emperor as if they were, you know, Louis XIV. And probably Louis XIV wasn't like we think Louis XIV was, but the Roman emperor certainly wasn't. And I spent quite a long time in the book just trying to sort of say, look, the palace is a lot weirder than this. I mean, for a start, and when we talked about um, banquets, there has been, in the central city imperial palace in Rome, there has been no identified kitchen. Now, that probably doesn't mean that they were living on takeaways, but <laughs> sort of might. Probably means that, you know, fire is kind of pushed the kitchens to the margins and we haven't found them but they certainly weren't having hot food I mean you know I suppose it is only sort of I mean the Brits are absolutely the awful example of people who expect their food to be hot no, you know no Mediterranean country expects their food to be hot well you certainly didn't get hot food uh, you got tepid food <laughs> in the imperial palace and there's nothing here and there's, there's nothing here of the kind of oddity of it all um you know, one of the things we know about the emperor is that he got given so much stuff. You know, an American president gets given quite a lot, not half as much as the Roman emperor got given. And there were storerooms and attics of all this kind of curious crap that the emperor got given. And there's one wonderful little tale of um, the emperor, we don't know which one it was, um, being given by some far distant ruler a real live centaur. Half man, half horse. Right? Really? Uh, uh, really. <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, 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 let me tell you the story and then we must move on. But um, this was sent by an Arabian prince to this emperor. Um, and it so it was first sent, this poor creature, um, to the governor of Egypt sort of send on to Rome. Um, <laughs> the poor thing died. Um, and the governor of Egypt, as he thought, oh, fuck, you know, what do you do now? <laughs> so, you know, you got this prize gift, the centaur, and it's gone and died, right? <laughs> Luckily, he's in Egypt, so he has it embalmed, because they're good at embalming. And then he sends it off to Rome. Um, heaven knows what happens there. All we know is that sometime later... 
a, a rather nerdish academic has heard about this dead centaur and is interested in curiosities and goes to the palace and he's quite well connected and he um, thinks that he's going to go and find the centaur. Um, nobody can find the centaur. Um, eventually he get, he's let into the basements or the storerooms or the attics and he does find it. Um, but he, he says, disappointingly, it was rather smaller than he'd imagined it might be, and it didn't smell very nice. Oh, right? What was it? He doesn't say what okay. it was. So we'll never what know. But not a centaur. That's what I can <laughs> guarantee it was not a centaur. I'm mindful that we need to get to some audience questions soon. Yeah. So just a reminder um, to... Check the. Um, I, let me put can we the change QR. This, the QR code so everyone can send their questions in via the QR code? I've just got a couple of last questions from me before we go to audience questions. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that sitting here today, it's the 21st century, we're all the way out in Nam, Melbourne. We feel like perhaps we couldn't be further away from ancient Rome and the world of the emperors. What relevance do you think ancient Rome has to us today? I think that um, wherever in the world you live, um, the shadow or the influence of Rome is still around. You can't get rid of the bastards, actually. Um, it, just in terms of, you know, just to take an obvious case, um, that um, the British Empire, not entirely, and I think in some ways this can be over-exaggerated, the British Empire saw itself partly in terms of the Roman Empire. They had problems about making that match because Britain was such a godforsaken marginal province in the, the Roman Empire. Um, and so they, there'd been a kind of strange reversal of hierarchy with the marginal province becoming the imperial centre. But it's hard to understand the what, how the British Empire at home is justified and how it's represented, except through thinking about them seeing themselves in part through the image of Rome. And I think that if you want to, uh, as I would want to do, kind of fundamentally challenge the whole notion of what the British Empire thought it was about, I think you can't do that unless you know what they were thinking, they were claiming to be about. And so I think that in terms of political challenge, you need to face the Romans head on. Because, you know, they're embedded in some of the ideas that we think are the worst and the best of um, the history of the last 2,000 years. You know, and it's not, all, it's not all about blood, guts and imperialism. It's also about what, you know, what is the nature of the citizen? You know, when, you know, it's not, it's not for nothing, although I think he didn't understand a word he was saying, that President Kennedy went to Berlin in the middle of the Cold War and said, ich bin ein Berliner, um, as the Romans said, kivis Romanus sum. Now, I think he didn't realise that the one time that we know the phrase Civis Romanus Sum was uttered by a Roman. It was by a Roman who was being illegally crucified in Sicily. And he was trying to say, you're not allowed to do this to me. Civis Romanus Sum, I am a Roman citizen. And he was killed anyway. You know, it's not a happy slogan. But it's still a slogan which made sense in modern world geopolitics. You know, at the height of the Cold War. And um, I think, I happen to think that the Romans are unfailingly interesting, even if nasty. And their own, I think, their challenges to their own system of oppression are extremely interesting. I mean, nobody has encapsulated the wrongs of empire better than his, the historian Tacitus in the second century CE, who said, what's the, you know, what's the Roman Empire all about? 
and he put it in the, the mouths of an opponent, but he said, what the Romans do, they make a desert and they call it peace. Now, if you want to see what's empire, an empire is a desert which goes under the name of peace. Mm -hmm. right? And I don't think anybody's ever got it better than that. And he did it in five words. And uh, you know, I, I think it's worth learning Latin in order to understand that. But I, I think you know, whether you find the Romans uh, interesting, challenging, uncomfortable, whatever, I think that I think we've got to face up to them because they still make a difference to how we talk about the world, to how we build the world, to how we um, we think about what power is. I don't know, how many cartoons of Roman emperors do you see? Oh, it's Nero fiddling while Rome burned, yet again. And there is any politician dressed up in Roman costume being a stupid idiot and not <laughs> getting his mind on the job. Now, you know, we, we can't... We, you know, I've kind of... Look, the bottom line is you can't beat them, join them. So um, <laughs> let's face up to the Romans uh, because you're never going to be able to ignore them. I think um, it was it Marshall McLuhan who said that uh, much of the world is still written upon 19th century lines. Would you disagree and say that the world's still written upon Roman lines? It is. Yeah, it is in many ways. You know, and the whole... Look, um, who was the first guy in the West, really, in any numbers, to have his head, his living head, on a coin, it was Julius Caesar. Right? We think that's a kind of fairly obvious thing to do. It was invented by the Romans. Why do we call the months of July and August, July and August? Because they're called after Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar. Right? You know, we, we live under the Romans. Um, probably, or perhaps not as much as we live under the 19th century. I think almost, you know, the Romans invented half of what we know, and the 19th century invented the rest. And the other half was trains. Mm. Yes, that's yes. right. Mm. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Let's um, go to some audience questions now. Um, let me have a quick look. Oh, this is a good one. Um, Historians are starting to use social media to engage audiences. How has the craft of communicating history changed in your career and what's the future? I swear I didn't submit that one. That wasn't me. <laughs> I'm not, I, mean, I think we'll have to ask Mary about this because you know, she's, uh, I would love to be a TikTok historian and- um, You can be. <laughs> but I'm, I think I've just, you know, you know, I'm just too old, you know? Um, I, in some ways, I think it hasn't changed as much as people think. You know, people are often say to me, oh, it's, you know, thank you so much, because you have really put the Romans back on the map, um, and you've got them on television, and, and, you know, I'm, you know, very pleased to have that accolade. But I remember when I was a kid, not only did I watch, when I was a bit older than a kid, the BBC's I, Claudius, which was probably the most influential television series ever. But I read popular books about the Romans by people we've now forgotten. You know, Michael Grant's biography of Nero partly got me into um, what Rome was all about. And if you look at the history of cinema, you know, it, Gladiator is only the last of many, you know, Ben Hur, you know, Spartacus, you know, you can, I am Spartacus, you know, is still a phrase that, can, that resonates with people. So I think that, I suppose, I think every generation refines the Romans for themselves. And they refine them new, and the Romans become new. Um, but I'm not sure that if we were to have a historical eye on this, we'd say we were doing anything we have different conclusions and different priorities, but we're doing the same thing. The Romans have never gone away. And now, happily, I think the Romans are also on TikTok. So <laughs> they'd be pleased. They would have loved it. <laughs> this is a great question. Um, how did the emperors and the empire fall apart? And what can be learned from that process today? How long have you got? <laughs> right, I think. You know, however many volumes have given. I think that is um, 
that is a really difficult one. Now, my husband, who's a Byzantinist, would say, well, look, don't forget that it didn't fall apart in the east of the empire. So, you know, you Westerners, you think that, you know, it fell apart in the fifth century. Well, go to Constantinople, mate, and it's still going strong. Uh, it, it's easy to say what didn't cause it than what did. Um, uh, you know, and I can tell you, I don't think it was mass migration, that's what some people would want to say. I, I, my answer to that is, is, is terribly unsophisticated, actually. I mean, I think that one of the things that um, really helps the regime that Augustus established it's not just his planning, whatever it was. He got, you know, the Roman regime got lucky for a few hundred years. Um, and they did manage to avoid civil war, just. Um, it was the skin of their teeth, but they did. And an old colleague of mine always used to say, look, if you, if you went to sleep in 1 BCE and you woke up in 201 CE, you'd still have been in the same world. You'd have recognized the world around you. You wouldn't have recognized the world around you in um, 401. See, so it's completely different. And to, to some extent, well, that's why I stop in the middle of the third century, is that that's the point they cease to be lucky. And whereas they've contained civil war up to that point, with just two brief periods of civil war. From 235 for, a, for about 50 years or more, they have a period of absolute continuous civil war. And that, in a sense, at least in the West, and that undermines the whole structure. And there are different ways in which it comes back. The Emperor Constantine, appealing to Christianity, uses Christianity as very much a bullock to, um, to, in a sense, reinstate Roman imperial power. But it's completely different. You, know, you can add to that all kind of, you, know, you can add to that plague, you can pandemic, um, and a variety of other, I think, epiphenomena. But I think in the end, it, they get killed by civil war. The Republic was killed by civil war. And in the end, the particular form of one man rule, well, one man rule itself goes on, but the particular form of it is killed by civil war. Mm. A bit of a uh, philosophical one here. Oh, God. Can you help explain the popularity of Stoic philosophy oh. in today's society? It, that is a look. I am no friend of Marcus Aurelius, <laughs> I have to say. Um, I sort of admire the guy. I grudgingly admire him. Um, his collection of cliched self-help slogans <laughs> that we um, know by the name of the meditations, I, I would be the first to admit, way outsells any of my own books. <laughs> Still, uh, well done him. Um, I have never understood the popularity, uh, particularly of, of Marcus. I mean, you know, I'm exaggerating slightly um, when it says, uh, you know, to say that, you know, he says things like, you know, when you get up in the morning, always make sure you know what you're going to do that day. <laughs> now, uh, that's a parody, but, 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 you know, and I think, that profound, you know? <laughs> It's very um, clean your room, isn't it? It's very, yeah, it's very mm. clean your room. Um, and, uh, but there is, however, something kind of quite exciting, I think, to imagine that a Roman emperor could be giving us those cliches. And it comes packaged with, this will get me into terrible trouble, probably including people in this room, um, that it comes packaged with the authority that a Roman emperor still brings. I mean, President Clinton is supposed to have kept a copy of Marcus Aurelius's meditations on his bedside table. How stupid is that? <laughs> <laughs> if you want some good bits, I mean, I think Marcus Aurelius is extremely interesting, much more interesting than his cliched self-help manual. 
um, is, uh, are his letters um, with letters between himself and his tutor Fronte, um, largely but not entirely before he becomes emperor, when you, you get you do get an extraordinary glimpse into um, the sort of training um, that these guys got. Not much, but you could see, begin to see what the life of an imperial prince was like, and it was, you know. It, it's kind of strangely sort of naive. I mean, he talks about, I spent the afternoon sitting on the couch with mummy. Right? And you think, huh? Right? And we went hunting and I didn't catch anything. But I have ca caught up with my homework. Thank you. Mm, no, I like his later work better, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you can, you can pick and choose with Marcus Aurelius. He's a nastiest, brutalist emperor. You ever imagine? Go and look at the column of Marcus Aurelius in Rome. Uh, the, the scenes of warfare directed by Marcus Aurelius are horrifying. Mm. On the topic of self-help books, um, <laughs> this is an interesting one. Is it possible that your book could be used by autocratic modern leaders or aspiring ones as a guidebook, almost oh. a mirror version of Machiavelli's The Prince? Oh, blimey, it is possible. <laughs> it is. It's been translated into many languages, too. So. Uh-oh. <laughs> so they won't have to read English. Um, uh, I think that it might give them cause to hesitate about the the kind of the mess they were getting themselves into, I hope. I hope it would put them off. But you can never tell. You can never <laughs> tell. Um, let's have a look. How do we navigate the divide between the romantic view of the Roman emperor and the practical realities of the banal everyday yeah. existence of the man? It's really hard. It's really hard. And, uh, and that's, in some ways, writing this book, that was one of the most difficult things. You know, I, when I started out, I think for a bit, I kind of thought, well, I'm not going to do any of those, you know, excessive anecdotes. Oh, you know, death by rose petal and all this kind of stuff. And then I realized there were two things that were the problem with that. Uh, one was, it left you with hell of a lot less to talk about if you didn't include them. But also, those anecdotes are important. I mean, I, I believe them, many of them, how do we know, but my hunch is that most of them are literally not true, that they're somewhere on the spectrum between made up and exaggerated. But it is what people went on saying about those emperors throughout the Roman Empire. So even... Just to say they aren't true was, you know, doesn't solve your problem because they're believed to be true, not just by us, but by people in the ancient world. And, and that brings you to the question of, so, you know, on the one hand, you've got, you know, the guy over here and what he's doing is basically he's writing endless letters, you know, signing off, saying... Okay, you know, dear Pliny, you know, please do use my architect to look at this or whatever. Kind of boring. And on the other, you've got this vision of him as utterly not like us, utterly not diurnal. And I don't know how I don't know how you put the two together. I mean, I've tried to do that, and I suppose in a way, where I think I succeeded best was in terms of the, of eating and banqueting. Because there you can, you can reconstruct something about how the dinners happened. You can see where they happened. You can go and sort of, you can sit where Nero would have reclined, literally, in the spot. Um, uh, uh, you can look at the servants who were the head of the napkin holders and whatever. You can see what the infrastructure was that kept this on the road. But you also... Uh, simultaneously can see how that image of the banquet became reinterpreted as the image of the centre of power. And I think that's, that's the easiest place. I think otherwise, you know, it's very hard. Um, all the tales of what, what emperors do on campaign and their military victories, 
very, very hard to know where to draw the line. Um, I try, but I think I'd, I'd start with a chapter on dinners. I know that you don't like being asked who your favourite emperor is yeah. or who your least favourite emperor is. We've got a great question here. Who do you think was the most unlikely man who managed to become emperor? Well, Claudius would say it was him, right? Um, you've got the story of Caligula um, is assassinated because, well, the story would be that he was a psychopathic maniac, but who knows? Caligula's assassinated. Um, then what happens? Oh, my God, who's going to be emperor now? Um, the soldiers who've assassinated him go round the, um, the palace compound. They think, God, I've got to find a new emperor. Um, they find, like, you know, looking behind a curtain, there's poor old Uncle Claudius, who's a bit of a nerd um, and a bit scared by what's going on. He's hiding behind the curtain. They say, oh, right, emperor. Come on, Claudius, you're emperor, right? And then they carry him off before he knows what he's doing. He's been carried into the army camp and he's been declared emperor. Oh, you know, how did that happen? Look, no hands. Now, um, <laughs> one... Uh, explanation of that is that he was the most li unlikely person on, you know, not wanting to do it, just found behind the curtain. Um, and that may be the case. You know, there's quite a lot of people, and I'm, I think, one of them who'd say, it's all a bit convenient, this story. This, you know, who, cui bono is always what you ask. Well, in this case, he just said, oh, I, didn't, I never wanted to be emperor. I was just called to it by um, the imperial guard. And then you say, well, who really was behind the death of Caligula then? Could it just possibly have been Uncle Claudius? I think maybe it could have been. Who knows? You know, then I'm doing as bad as, you know, I'm doing as bad as all the people who <laughs> kind of blame Livia for everything. But um, so, uh, you know, Claudius, I call it the traditional narrative, Claudius, but I'm not sure I believe it. We are unfortunately running out of time, but um, one last uh, cheeky question that came with a winky face emoji from the audience. Oh, God. Referencing a famous TikTok trend. Oh, right. How often do you think about the Roman Empire? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> Mary Beard. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank Colin Hunter Jr. Jr. again, uh, the State Library of Victoria, and our wonderful Auslan interpreter. Uh, the readings book stand will remain open, I think, out there, uh, with a limited number of signed uh, copies of Emperor of Rome available for purchase. And I think Mary's yeah. agreed to... I'll, I'll sign any more. If we've got more, I will... There's quite a few have been signed already, but if you want them dedicated, I'll do that. If you just want to grab a signed copy, pay for it and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and go. That's fine. You don't have to have it dedicated. I hope we've got it all organised so that um, uh, as many people can be kept happy as possible. Please join me in thanking Professor Mary Beard. Thank you.